أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Dear brothers and sisters, we are fortunate, alhamdulillah, to have uh, uh, Imam Dawood Alim with us and also Imam Siraj Wahaj. And if Dr. Jamal Badawi comes, we'll let him in. If he doesn't show up, well, tough luck. Uh, so let me uh, introduce the lecture first, and then I'll let uh, uh, Imam Dawood will, inshallah, make a presentation, and then Imam Siraj will come and uh, join us. Uh, Imam Dawood Alim is the Imam of the Detroit Masjid of Al-Islam. He uh, addresses many conferences, including the uh, Educational Conference of Muslim World League in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he also assisted us in scheduling the visit and the trip of Imam Walid al-Din Muhammad to this convention. We thank him very much for all his, all his help and cooperation in this respect. The title of today's lecture is indeed a title, and I'll spend a minute before I let him take the uh, podium. I'll let you know, get a feeling for what we had in mind. The title is Ibadah and its effect on the life of the Muslim. And let me remind you that we as Muslims, we worship Allah. And this is Ibadah, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as, uh, Ibn, as Ibn Taymiyyah is saying, وَلَا نَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّا We worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ibadah itself is taken from an Arabic word which means abada, abada tariq, which paved the road for the people, made the road submitting to us. That's how it's derived. Uh, so we say we submit to none except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Taymiyyah told us also, and he's one of the greatest scholars in our history, uh, he said you may worship somebody, you may love somebody, and at the same time if you show submission to him, then it's not ibadah. But in order to have ibadah you have to show submission and love both at the same time. And that we give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Somebody might force you to submit to him. And if you submit to somebody under force, but you don't have that love in your heart, this is not ibadah. So ibadah is only done to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we examine the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and how this ibadah had an effect on the early Muslims that were living with him, we'll understand how it did have an effect and impact on the people who were living. For example, if you look to the most oppressed people at that time, which were the slaves, were the lowest. The slave dared not look with an open eye at his master at that time. They weren't able just to look straight into the eyes of his master or her master. But hours after meeting with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, receiving the meanings of ibadah, he goes to his master back and reads to his master the first surah that was revealed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That oppressed, that weak, was reading to his master a verse which was revealed early to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that verse was, Kalla la illam yantahi la nasfa'am bin nasir. If he doesn't stop, we'll hit him on the forehead. Imagine now, the slave is saying this to his master. If he doesn't stop, we'll hit him on his forehead. Meaning, if you don't stop, we'll use force with you. That's the effect of ibadah. Goes to his master and says, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ أَعْيُنٌ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ آذَانٌ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا أُولَئِكَ كَالْأَنْعَامِ بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلْ They have hearts that do not understand and eyes that do not see 
and hearts or ears that do not hear. They are like cattle or even worse. You can see the tremendous change now and the effect on the life of the people who were living with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is exactly what we are aspiring for. And this is exactly what we're looking for to see the effect of ibadah on the life of every Muslim, inshallah. And now I leave Imam Dawood to give his presentation and will Imam Siraj will join us shortly, inshallah. Go ahead, brother. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Nasta'inuhu, nasta'firuhu, wa nukminu bihi aza wa jal. Wa salati wa salam, wa sallallahu kareem, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ilmubah. It's an honor and a privilege to be in the company of those that believe as I believe. The community of Muslims, believers in Allah and followers of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The prayers and the peace be on him. Before we get into the subject, I want to say that the Muslim life in America can be just as great as any place in this world. Because no matter how big man sees himself, or no matter how large the oppressor may appear to be, this religion was given to us by Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. And it's Allah that we give the praise. So there is no reason to apologize for being Muslim. There's no reason to apologize for believing the way you believe that there's none that deserves worship except Allah and Muhammad to whom the Quran is revealed is this final messenger, prophet, the seal of the prophets, a mercy to all people. We are in a great situation because Allah sees everything. We don't have a Lord and creator that is isolating himself from our presence. Allah is as close as our juggler vein. So we have to build a confidence within ourselves. We have to build a confidence within our loved ones and our associates that it's okay to be Muslim. The Prophet Muhammad, the prayers and the peace be on him, he gave us an excellent example. And there was a statement that he made and, and in the, what the Prophet said was, none of you will gain entry into paradise until you first become believers. And then he said, wah, and none of you will become believers until you become loving people. And we must love Allah, we must love the Prophet, we must love those in authority over us, the scholars, the lawmakers, the parents, the husbands, the wives, the teachers, the educators, the business people, the children, the government. See, we must love these things because everything must cover down from, first of all, belief in one God, Allah, and acceptance of Muhammad as being the messenger of Allah. The Quran speaks of that verse, Ibadillah, it talks about worship. It doesn't leave worship only at the point where we say we worship Allah and we, and we follow the Prophet. But the Quran speaks also of all those in authority after us. It says obey Allah, obey the Prophet, obey those in authority, and it goes on. And it, and it indicates with us that it's a lot of us are involved in the obedience. And for the believer, we say, we hear and we obey. The English language can be tricky 
because of the way it's designed. But the Quran and us asking for guidance from Allah, we have to keep our mind focused on what is best for us. For the young people out here, Maya, the Muslim Arab Youth Association conventions came into existence because of you all. The parents that came here from different countries begin to see a need that there's some kind of way we have to reassure our children. We have to reassure our family and loved ones that our Islam is something that is important to us. And this convention came about so the children would be able to be in association with other Muslims and see that it's okay. That our girls would not become so influenced by the ideas of what looks convenient and popular. But our daughters would begin to see that our Islam is still alive and that because you're in America don't think that the Muslim is not here also. And for our boys to begin to see that it's okay. Someone has to take the lead as time goes on. Our prophet, the prayers and the peace be on him, he says, seek knowledge to the cradle to, from the cradle to the grave. Then yes, we look at that, and we see a very simple meaning. I'm not telling you something you don't know, but there's another meaning. If I'm seeking knowledge from the cradle to the grave, it is acknowledging to my intellect, it is acknowledging to my senses that I am going to leave here one day. And therefore, when I leave here, I must leave the situation in better shape so someone behind me can assume the responsibility. And for us as Muslims, it's the establishment of this religion, al-Islam, for the betterment of all people. This is what it's saying. We must remember that the Muslim has a charitable heart. That the Muslim must be able to extend their charity that we should not isolate ourselves. We should not re 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 withdraw the good of what Allah Ta'ala has given us in the Quran and the freedom to be able to express it and the freedom to be able to live it and grow and to produce the quality of people, the quality of life that will be better for all mankind. This is the religion of Al-Islam. If we take the time of our prophet to prayers and the peace be on him, he came into a situation that was very, very, very barren in dark ages, the Jahiliyyah. And with his faith in Allah and the closeness of men and women taking a love for Allah, a love for Muhammad, the support of others outside of the religion, Al-Islam came in the final complete state. In its completion was the Quran clarified the mistakes of those before and God Most High says and given us a complete book. And we have now, because of that great history, the opportunity to learn and to continue to grow from it. Why? Because Allah said there will be no more to come after Muhammad. So we should be enthused about this. There should never be anything in this world that puts a damper on a Muslim spirit so much that we forget about the fact that Allah is bigger. Our daily prayer, the first thing we acknowledge is Allahu Akbar. And in the acknowledgement of Allahu Akbar, we are acknowledging the fact that we recognize that there's nothing bigger than Allah. And it is even telling us that even in our salat, it's even reminding us even in our salat, even in our pure form of our prayer, our private prayer, our open prayer to Allah, that even that is not enough for us. Allah is bigger than that. So after we get off of the floor, there's still a responsibility to our obedience and our devotional life the life that will bring us closer to our Lord and our cleanliness. Ibadah, the word itself and the verb abadah is talking about to serve. 
The word has movement. When you become a service to something, then that means that we take the Sha'aratain and say, we bear witness that there's none that deserves worship except Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger, and then we have to begin to serve that idea. We have to begin to serve that principle in our life. We have to begin to look at the things that are most closest to us that we need to correct first. And the most closest to us is ourself. And then we have to be able to establish the idea of education. We have to be able to create an environment for our loved ones to be able to be in competitively for the spirit of developing the best of this religion. As Muslims, we are in a race for all that is good. We are in a race to enjoy that which is right. And we are in a race to forbid that which is evil. And these are the words of Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. Highly glorified is Allah. As we look at this more, think about our own private prayer. If we look at the prayer itself, the prayer gives us the indication that there's a physical cleanliness involved, that the Muslim life, the whole devotion to God, the whole devotion to Allah in itself is cleanliness. It's an obligation to cleanliness. We have to make wudu, or we make ablution. It is sending to the minds of the conscious that, hey, we have to clean our physical life. We have to be able to clear our vision and our perception and how we see things. And then it goes further, though. In our religion, we can't come up here and pray and make up what we want. The imam that needs to cook the, the prayer, he can't say words that he wants to say. If the mother is home leading the children in prayer, she can't say what she wants to say. The Muslim prayer has to be the words of Allah. Never do we get off course. We are always reminded. So therefore, in our spiritual devotion, our cleanliness of our spiritual life, and our devotion at that point is with the words of Allah. And then, the knowledge of the Qur'an. The bigness of the knowledge. The knowledge itself. It, none can match it. God Most High said, told Muhammad to tell them, if they can produce a book like this, let's see them. So now we even have mental stimulation. We have the stimuli of the intellect that will enhance us and give us the confidence to begin to move forward. It teaches us the wisdom of how to survive in the world. It shows us the angles of the whisperer on the bigger side of shaitan to the smaller shaitan, whispering and withdrawing, giving suggestions, trying to create diversity and division in the family, making us forget, trying to put our minds in the insignificance of this, having us rationalize and justify that prayer is not important. Having us stretched out away from each other. Our prophet, the prayers in the peace be on him, when he told the Muslims on Mount Arafat, as you know, the word comes from the word to Arafu, to know. Great significance in that word because it brings people together and you can't see the king that's beside you or the rich one or the poor one, it would be very difficult to determine who is who as we circumvent the Kaaba. And then as we sit in Arafat, we all have to be there asking for the mercy of Allah, asking for his blessings, asking for his help, seeking his assistance. No man stands out from this. Not his importance, not his intellect, not his knowledge, not his fame, not his popularity. We all have to humble to the one Lord. 
It becomes so exciting sometimes that we want to leap up the hill to the mount of Jabba. We want to just leap up there. We want to leap the light where the prophet gave the last sermon. We want to leap up there. Thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. And we forget that we just want to get to the top. And everybody else wants to get to the top. Some of us make it, some of us don't. But we were there where the prophet said that Arafat, that is the Hajj. And we have to submit ourselves to believe that this is a world that Allah is bigger. And that no matter what you and I gain in this world, it should always be something after us that will continue to gain to become significant. Ibadallah, to worship Allah and the effects that it has on the Muslim is a, is, 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 is a practice of, is, 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 is a practice. And our prophet, the prayers and the peace be on him, as he spoke of the five essentials. He said the religion is based on the structure of five. Buni al-Islam, Mualim Kapsin. That the, 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 the essentials of the religion is based on the mighty five. And if we see the five, then we see we can make a distinction as we elaborate. First of all, belief in one God, we've clarified the argument. There's no other gods. Allah is sufficient. And then we have Salat. And we carry this out because this prayer to Salat humbles us to let us know no matter how big a man becomes, how big a woman is, how rich, how poor, whatever, we have to be obedient to Allah. And we have to pray. And we have prescribed times. We can't even say, I'll pray when I get ready. Now, we go to Zakat. There, the Muslim is coming into a sense of more responsibility. We take our money out of our pocket, and then we have to see where the money is going to go. And if we follow the way of Muhammad the Prophet, then we know the money, first of all, some of it should go to the salvation and, 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 and uh, the continuation of our Ummah. Education. Islamic schools. Making sacrifices to make sure that, that worthy Muslims qualify themselves and we support them in business as well as in the academic arena and whatever else we have to do. Our money now has a form. Our money now has a purpose. Yes. Our life was structured on the mighty five. As I told you earlier, for you young people, your parents love you. They love you more than they could ever tell you. Because they want to see the religion flourish in your genes. And Allah, in His infinite great wisdom, is min kuli shay. So he has the power. And if we believe that, we will begin to see a movement of activity within our life because Ibadah is talking about the obedience to the devotional life of the Muslim in everyday activities, the total person. Then we go to fasting. During the month of Ramadan, this is when the Muslim fasts. This is our fast. And in the fast, we shouldn't allow people to tell us that it's difficult. They have psychologists and everybody writing things about fasting is dangerous. How in the world is a man going to tell us what Allah said is right?
So if anything, we need to get in the race and we have to create a newspaper. Somebody has to be friendly. Some of you know Muslims that are newspaper reporters. And if you're close to them, you're going to have to sit down and tell them, straighten up. You're going to have to write one paragraph that's right, and that paragraph should refute that statement to say, fasting is from God, Allah. Now the fast that they're talking about might be dangerous, but any time Allah tells us to eat only at night before the sun come up, and an hour before the sun rise, and don't eat anymore until after Maghrib, then that fast is successful. And we have to be able to share this. Because if we do, then the people will begin to respect us more. And don't ever believe that the American public is against Al-Islam. They are enemies who have become billionaires and, and, and multi-billionaires who are enemies to anything that's going to take away from them. And that's the same way it was in the time of the Prophet. But what we have to know is that the masses of people, these are the people that we must reach out to and share with them and let them know that Al-Islam is the only religion in, the, in this country that can bring stability to the man, the mind of the male and the female. And that's not to take away from anything else. That's not even an indictment on anybody else. But we have to believe this. Western world has identified Sayyidina Muhammad, Sayyidina Basharun, the greatest teacher, our dear prophet, the prayers and the peace be on him. They have identified him as being the most impactful, greatest man that ever lived to bring impact in this world. That's recorded time. And what did he bring? What did they say his miracle was? The Quran that was revealed by Allah through the angel Jibreel. But the miracle went further. Arabia was turned around. Arabia was slowed down and brought to a civilized condition. And then the prophet told all of his companions, to leave Mecca and go throughout the world and teach as much of the religion as you know and as you've seen there is over a billion of us and we still count them by the praise be to Allah Alhamdulillah let us just look at that this religion starts in the peninsula and it extends itself all over the world and some of you have been all over there if you look at the, the, the terrain if you look at how these countries are made, if we look, we have to ask ourselves that it could be nothing but Allah that allowed this to happen. Because it was rough in the heat, the mountains, the deserts. Very rough and very difficult to travel on. Travel through and to go from one point to another. But men had knowledge, they had faith in Allah. And they believed. And they were loving people. And when they went, the Muslims dignified themselves. They did not go into Africa. And they did not go into Asia. And, and, and Persia at that time there, Iran, and, and all the rest of the countries. They didn't go into those countries with some savage behavior. They went in there with dignity. And the, people, and the people respected that. They treated the women with, 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 with great, great care. And the people saw that these people were different. And they wanted to become a part. Our religion has an effect on everyone if we practice the religion ourselves. Our religion is a religion where we must trust Allah. We should not be trying to make the religion work for someone else. We should be trying to make sure that it works for us. Allah Most High says in the Quran, 
Ar Rahman, Al Al Quran, Kalak Al Insan. Now Allah is telling us with this that He said the most merciful. It is He who teaches the Quran. And after he teaches the Quran, then the man is created. And then he gives the man intelligence and speech. And then the man has to become responsible for the vegetation and the animals in the society and the life itself. So we have an obligation that our religion demands that we as people take the religion outside of the massages, take the religion outside of our homes, and live the religion in the dignified way and be glad and thankful to Allah that he has given us an example in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and an example in all the people who have been beneficial in this religion because our line continues to extend itself and with you and I it will continue to extend itself and we should be thankful and glad and never apologetic for being Muslim. And if we take the five pillars and live the life of the Muslim and begin to become more comfortable and share our life and looking at people for their value, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim, but seeing the good because Allah is the one that allowed them to be created and follow Muhammad the Prophet closely in his handling of situations. And I guarantee you, we will become better. This conviction will extend itself beyond the realms of this hotel won't be big enough. And I assure you that the impact in the future of America will have something because of the impact of Islamic influence. Now Islam is here to dominate, but it's not to dominate. It will become influential. It will become something where people see logic and reasoning that will help them improve their life. And when we see that, our job is not to dominate. Our job is to bring them the words of Allah and to bring them the wisdom of our prophet, the prayers and the peace be on him. May Allah's mercy be with us. We thank you. We pray Allah that we benefit from this. All of us, we heard some of it. We ask his guidance, his protection. And with most of all, we ask him for his mercy and forgiveness and forgive us all of our sins. And anyone that was affected and offended, may Allah's mercy be with me and with you. Because certainly my intention was to benefit all of us. I have nothing to gain but my love for Allah. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you, Imam Dawood. May Allah bless you. Brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, the ibadah does have an effect on us. The way we dress, the way we talk, the way we love one another, even the way we smile at one another is really an effect of ibadah on us. My neighbor comes to me, his office, next to my office, offers his help to my community when he hears that I'm a leader of my community in Lawrence, Kansas. Says my specialization area I work in is fighting drugs and alcohol. And I told him my community doesn't have any interest in that. We don't have this problem. He was shocked. I said, we don't even discuss it. Does it come to our mind? Alhamdulillah. He asked for a copy of the Quran. I gave him a copy of the Quran. Came the next day, saying he read more than a hundred pages. And he had no problem at all. Everything looked fine. The next day, came and said, he read a couple of hundred paper again, and he had no problem with any of the words. And he was telling me he was amazed how he could find a book that agrees with most of what he had. The third day, came in and said to me that today I have a problem. And I expected that he would, he must have come across some of the verses that we all try to explain to non-Muslims. So I told him, what's your problem? He said, my problem is I think I'm going to become a Muslim. 
Wallahi, that's what happened. And that were the words that he said. So Alhamdulillah, Ibadah does have an effect on us. And Muhammad وسلم, teaches us to have this dignity. In the middle of the battle of Uhud, when the Muslims lost the battle, and I want you to listen carefully, this is very important for us. And I meant to say it, though I'm taking some of your time, but I guess this is a statement that should be engraved in the heart of every Muslim. In the middle of losing the battle, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi losing a battle, and you know what happens when everybody is losing a battle. Everybody is trying to save his life. In the middle of all of that, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looks into around him, sees some of the unbelievers on top of the mountain, looking down, and there the Muslims are at the bottom of the valley. So physically they were higher than the Muslims. Immediately Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the few people who were next to him, though the rest tried to escape and save their, their lives. He said to them a statement that we should always remember. And that statement was, Yajib Alla Ya'aluna Ahad. None should be above us. None should be above us in the middle of defeat. And he ordered his companions to go around the mountain and drive those guys away. And they did. And then they managed to find a way out of this defeat. This is how Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches us how the ibadah should have an effect on us. And I'm sure Imam Siraj knows how this effect is going to be. So would you kindly please come in? Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Nahmadu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'gfiru wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakul alayhi. Wa na'udhu billah min shuri nfusina min sayati ahmalina. Min yahdi la fa la mudilla la fa man yulla wa fa la hadiya la. Nashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahduhu la sharika la. Wa shadu anna muhammadin abduhu wa rasulluhu amma ba'd. Brothers and sisters, yesterday morning, I was in the LaGuardia Airport on my way to come here to see you. I had to get up about 4 o'clock in the morning and get myself ready. And the flight was scheduled to leave around 6 in the morning. And there in the airport, by myself, in the United uh, Terminals, United Airlines Terminals, I faced toward Mecca, and I made my prayer. About 5.45. I couldn't make it home or the master because it wasn't in by the time I left. But yet I had to make it there. Many of us have been in circumstances like that. It's time for prayer. I'm not at home. I'm not in the masjid. Where should I make my prayer? Why did I decide to make prayer publicly in that terminal? What made me do it? I will never forget this number, 10,950, 10,950. You know what that represents? When I was 19 years old, I wanted to become a Muslim, but there was no one to guide me to what real Islam was. And myself probably, Imam Dawood probably had the same experience. And I joined a group thinking that they were Muslims. 
And I stayed there from 1969 to 1975. And I will tell you, all those years, I never prayed once as Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said pray. And therefore, I, Saraj Wahaj, missed 10,900 and 50 prayers. But alhamdulillah, when I became a Muslim, and I heard the words of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he said, Sallu Pray as you see me pray. And if you don't pray the way Prophet Muhammad Wasallam taught us, we haven't prayed. Why did I say this and what was my purpose for saying this? Allah the Almighty says in Quran, Hafidhu ala salawat wa salat al wusta. God preserve, watch over your prayers, especially the middle prayer. Some of us are afraid, ashamed, practice our religion. Sometimes we're forced in public to practice our religion. We are ashamed. Yet there are people, I watch them. Look at this podium here. You see how big this podium is? Imam Dawood, I've seen people who walk around with radios the size of this podium. They carry it on their shoulder. And I'm telling you, this lot. And it's, and it's loud. And they're dancing. They're not ashamed. I was driving my daughter the other day. We were driving the car. And there was a car in front of us. And the guy in the car was moving. And, you know. And they're not afraid. They're not ashamed. People are not ashamed to be what they are. Why should I be ashamed to practice Islam? Why should I be ashamed that if I'm in Kennedy Airport or LaGuardia Airport or Detroit, somebody going to look at me? I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I'm proud. If they're not ashamed to dance and be a fool, why should I be ashamed to pray before my Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now, brothers and sisters, what I'd like to do um, uh, today, inshallah, for a few moments, we have got to get more out of our ibadah, our worship, than we're getting now. We must get more than we're getting now. And I just don't think that we're getting as much as we can. Therefore, I prayed to Allah even before I came here. Oh, Allah, please help me. I, I have no guidance to give the people, and the only guidance comes from you. It comes from your messenger Muhammad Sallallahu So I beg Allah, oh Allah, please help me for whoever comes to this session then we can give them something not from Siraj Wahaj, but something from Allah and His Messenger that's going to make them better in their ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think Allah has helped me. And the next few moments I'm going to share with you what I think that Allah has inspired me with from the studying of the Sharia, especially Al Quran and the Sunnah. Now, brothers and sisters, our worship is supposed to have an effect on us. I can say this, I know what I used to be in the dunya. And Allah has blessed me now, I'm a different man than I was then. I'm a better person, I have more character, more everything. And alhamdulillah, I feel myself very blessed and in the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just to be able to say I'm Muslim. No, I'm not a scholar. No, I don't consider myself a scholar at all. At best, I'm a student who loves to study, and I love to share what Allah has blessed me with. A scholar? No. A brother who loves Allah and His Messenger, and my credentials perhaps, and Allah knows best, is my sincerity and my faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and hope that somehow I can share something with you from our experiences that will make you, help you to become a better Muslim, inshallah. Now, brothers and sisters, about three years ago, um, we were in court, some Muslims. 
And uh, in the courtroom in New York City, whenever the judge comes, the court officer makes everyone rise. And so the judge comes out with his black robe. And the court officer said, all rise, the judge. And that day was a full courtroom. I'll never forget it. We were sitting down there, a group of Muslims, and they said, all rise, the judge is here. And I told the Muslims, remain seated. And then the court officer ran to us, well, you can't do that, you have to stand. I said, sir, I mean no disrespect to the judge. The fact that we're here in this courtroom shows our respect for the judge, but I refuse. We refuse to stand. We can only stand for our Lord. We stand for Allah. Allah. Allah is my witness. The next day we had to go to court again, the same courtroom, filled up. And the court officer, when the judge came, he said, the judge is here, all remain seated. And we set the precedent in New York City. You don't stand for no judge. Why should I stand for a judge? Somebody said, oh, Imam Siraj, that's too radical. Why do you do that? You know why I do it? Because I refuse to have khushua, humbleness, in front of anybody except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why and what we're going to talk about today. Ibadah true ibadah and true worship. What makes us different is our worship. And the worship is supposed to do something to us. Now there's two aspects, brothers and sisters, that I like to talk about. One is the worship itself. And then it is what the worship is supposed to do to us. Some fail because they don't protect their prayer. Whenever my children ask me, Dad, can you take us out? I take them bowling, I take them to a nice movie, I take them somewhere, but any time we go out, it's based around the schedule of the prayer. Because in my mind, if we're in the movies at 2 o'clock and it's time for Thor, what are we going to do? So I'm not going to go to the movies during the time of Thor. I'm going to wait until after Margaret or a time where I can make the, that we can see and have entertainment but not violate our prayer. Because there's no entertainment worthy of us missing even one salat. So therefore, when you plan to go out, I remember years ago, I was a young Muslim, a young in, in understanding. We went to Shea Stadium in New York City. It was a boxing match, match between uh, Duran and, and Lennon. Uh, no, Sugar, yeah, Sugar Ray Lennon. Sugar Ray Lennon. And about seven of us Muslim men, we went to watch the boxing match. And right before it began, it was time for Salat. I said, come, come on, brother, let's go. I said, where are we going? I said, we're going to make prayer. What do you mean, where are we going? <laughs> Some went. Some stayed. But we went and we made our prayer. I went, I said, look, sir, I went to one of the officers. I said, look, I'm going to make a strange request. See, we're Muslims. And uh, is there any way we can make our prayer? And it took us to an office where we made our prayer. But I wanted to, I don't want to miss my prayer. I want to see the boxing match. But I don't want to miss my prayer. So everything we do must be around the prayer. And I'm not going to make no excuse for myself. And we shouldn't make excuses for ourselves. I was invited to uh, dinner at the mayor's house. And I had it planned. I said, okay, you know, on the way to the mayor's house, uh, there's a masjid on the way, on the road, you know. So I'll get off the road, I'll go to the masjid, I'll make salat. And then after that, I'll go to the mayor's house. I went to the masjid, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, closed. I was... I was nine to three, masjid. Masjid. So I went in the park. It made my prayer. 
I've made prayer in the, in the, in the airport in, in London, England. What's the name of that hotel? That, um, Heathrow. Heathrow. And all over. So brothers and sisters, we have to watch our prayer. God, God our prayer. Oh, wait, I'm going to be, I'm going to be at, uh, I got to go there. I have this meeting. Where am I going to make my prayer? Where am I going to make my prayer? In Alhamdulillah, New York City, over 100 masjids. Almost everywhere you go, there's some masjid somewhere. But you have to have in your mind where you're going to make prayer. I remember once we had a brother, very prominent, working in the government, went to his house for a meeting. And uh, it's Maghrib time. I said, brother, alhamdulillah, you know, it's time for prayer. He said, oh, oh, yeah, okay. He said, Imam, Siraj, you lead the prayer. I said, no, brother, no, you lead the prayer. And you know what he did? He was looking around in his house, wondering where the Qibla is. <laughs> so you must, especially Salah. Imam Daud mentioned that way. Imam Daud mentioned the ibadah, Bunyal Islam al khams Islam is built on five. He mentioned the five, but especially prayer. I couldn't believe it. I had a meeting in my office recently. Husband and wife, brother wanted a divorce. Frivolous reason. Want to divorce his wife. Frivolous. And found out a man hasn't prayed himself in six months. How you go six months, brother, without praying? Well, I, I'm a Muslim. I, I don't pray, but I'm a Muslim. Uh, you going to fast in Ramadan? No, I'm not going to fast, but I'm a Muslim. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's taught us very well. Whoever leads it, whoever leaves the Salat, they're disbeliever. Salat separate yourself a believer from a disbeliever. You can't go on saying, well, I'm a, I'm a Muslim, but I don't pray. It's like saying I'm a fish, but I don't swim. You are defined by your ibadah. You are defined by your worship. It's not a label you take on. You, you wear the name Muslim. But the, it's more than the name. It's the actual practice of the faith. So brothers and sisters, the first part of my talk, I want to make sure, encourage all of us that all of the ibadat, especially the five that Brother Imam mentioned, that we must practice it. But now I want to go a step further. You ever finish prayer and get up and feel like you haven't really even prayed? Did you ever, while you were praying, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Did I pay that bill this morning? <laughs> Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. My wife was wrong in that argument. <laughs> Ar-Rahmanirrahim. My teacher gave me the wrong mark. Do you find yourself sometimes in your prayer, your, your mind wandering, can't focus? I saw one brother once praying. He was making some prayer. I was watching him. And he made so many rock arts. He didn't know where he was. <laughs> he had gone back and gone back. I said, brother, do you know how many rock arts you made? Was it two? <laughs> it's true. So what, what make us? Not to focus on our prayer. Or do you ever get out of your prayer and go do something haram? I ask Allah to help me, to help you this evening, this afternoon, that we can get something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brother Siraj, he knows nothing. I only know something of Quran and something of Sunnah prayer. And I'm, I'm focusing especially on prayer. Because brothers and sisters, this is the key 
If you study the Quran, so many places, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentioned prayer so many times. So this is Allah's agenda. That if we are Muslim, then we must follow Allah's agenda. Teach the people as Allah wants us to teach and as the Prophet Muhammad taught it. So I'm going to concentrate on all the ibadah, especially the salah, and what I'm saying applies for all of the ibadah, ibadat. Okay? Now, brothers and sisters, some of us believe that worship is an ending to itself. I did my prayer. I completed my relationship with my Lord. Now I can go about my business. Others believe that prayer is not an end, but a means to an end. So once you do the worship, you are not finished. It's supposed to move you to do something, to be something. And the reality is, both of them are right. It is an end to itself, but it also means to another end. The evidence is in Quran. Listen. A'udhu billahi mina shaytani rajeem Ya ayuhan nasubudu rabbakumu alladhi khalaqakum wa alladhina min qablikum la'allakum ta'taqoon Taqwa. Ya ayuhan alladhina amanu kutiba alikum usiyamu kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum la'allakum yeah, you are nas, oh mankind. Worship your Lord who created you and those before you. Worship him that you may receive taqwa. Worship is to receive taqwa, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You worship Allah in order to receive to fear Allah. Two months from now. Yeah, you are Ladina Aminu Kutiba Alekum Usiyam. Kama Kutiba Aladina Min Kabalikum. Lalukum Tatakun. Fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those who came before you in order that you may receive taqwa. You don't fast on Ramadan and say, I did it, it's over. Now I can go back to business as usual. No, you're supposed to come out of Ramadan as a graduate. And now you step out now. I fasted for a month, got myself together. Now, for the next rest of the year, inshallah, I'm going to try to have this taqwa. Yeah, the development of taqwa. And what will do it is the ibadah, proof, evidence. A'udhu billahi mina shaytani rajeem. Utla ma hiya ilayha mina... Utlu ma hiya ilaykum mirabikum. Wa qimu salat. إِنَّ صَلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَأْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرُ وَلَذِكُرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ Salat keeps one away from فَأْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرُ Evil and indecency and the remembrance of Allah is the greatest. Now, you know I like to walk, right? I have to pick up something. What do I pick up? Two mics. This one? You choose. My, my choice. But since I'm sorry, I, I, I can't stand still. You know me. Plus it's hot up here. 
Now listen, brothers and sisters, I'm going to try to share a few things with you now so that the next prayer you make, or the next prayer we make, is going to be a better prayer, inshallah. We have to make Salat al-Maghrib, the next prayer, right? Let's make an our intention, inshallah, our next prayer is going to be better. And from this day forward, our prayers are going to be better, inshallah. That's our niyyah. Listen to this. One day, Prophet Muhammad wasalam, was in the masjid, sitting with some of his sahaba. And when he sat there, one of the sahaba came in. And you know something about our Prophet wasalam, He's very observant, always looking, observant. And that person who came in prayed. And after praying, came to the Prophet and said, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. Peace and blessings be upon you, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet said, Farajit fasalli. He says, Wa alaikum salam. Farajit fasalli, for inna kalam tu salli. Go back and pray, for you have not prayed. You have not prayed. So the man got up. He was a companion. He accepted the prophet. He went and prayed again. And when he returned, he said, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. The prophet said, Wa alaikum salam fa'arjit fa'salli fa'inna kalam tu salli. Go back and pray. For you have not prayed. And the man went back again. And he prayed. And came back and said, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah wa alaikum salam fa'ajit fa'salli fa'inna kalam tu salli Go back and pray for you have not prayed. The man said, O Messenger of Allah, I know no better prayer than this. Teach me to pray. And so the Prophet wasalam, taught him to pray. How many of us, if we we're praying and the prophet saw us when he said, Father just for Sully, we're in the kalam to Sully. Go back and pray, for you have not prayed. I'll go a step further. One day, Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu an, is watching as a man came into the masala, to the masjid, and he started praying and he recited Surah Al Furqan. And he recited to Surah Al-Furqan in a way that Umar never heard before. And Umar was so disturbed from the way he was reciting the Qur'an that he wanted to grab him in his Salat. But he restrained himself and waited until the prayer was over. And when the prayer was over, he took a scarf and tied it around his neck and dragged him to the Messenger of Allah. Now Umar was bad. And the Prophet said, Umar, let him go. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I heard him recite Al-Quran, Surah al Fukan, in a way I never heard before. I heard you recite it. You taught me, and he didn't recite like you. The Prophet said, recite. And the man recited, and the Prophet wasalam, said, he's correct. Now, Umar, you recite. And Umar recited the way the Prophet taught him, different from that Sahaba. And the Prophet said, you are correct, for the Qur'an has been revealed seven different ways. You know what? i tell you the truth. If Umar ibn al-Khattab were alive today, I wouldn't recite no Qur'an. Not me. Until I make sure every alif, every bad, every Every tall. My question is this. Are we praying the right way? Maybe we have learned the Salat the wrong way. So every once in a while, we should check to make sure that our Salat is correct. I recommend a good book for you. It's called, I think, Prayer of the Prophet, written by... Um, Nasruddin al-Albani, excellent book, excellent book, you can check 
your salat to make sure where your hands, where, how do you, how do you bow, how do you, how make sure you're making your prayer the right way. So we have to make sure that we're praying the right way. Now, brothers and sisters, I am under the, I, I, I know 100% that the problems of this world is because of their disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're not going to have the answers. President Clinton or the rest of the world and its leaders will not have the answer until they follow the guidance of Allah and His Messenger Muhammad And if you study the history of the prophets, all of them came with the same divine solution, the ibadat, the worship. And this country will never get together until they return to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I'm not going to take a long time, brothers and sisters. I want, you to, I want you to get this and get it well. Now, we talked about the quantity of our prayers, making prayer five times a day, every day. But now we're talking about the quality of our prayer. You wonder why I mentioned in the beginning about the judge and why I was in court. I wasn't trying to be um, uh, arrogant when I told the judge that we would not stand in his courtroom. I wasn't trying to be arrogant. I was trying to make a point. Every salat you make should contain, contain three things. Every salat that you make should contain at least these three things. Number one, khushua, humbleness. Brothers and sisters, I was in that courtroom and I saw person after person stand before the judge humble. Yes, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Begging mercy to the judge. This humbleness before the judge. And that humbleness should be only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Respect those in authority. We obey the laws. But this humbleness, I bow to no one except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I love my sensei who teaches martial arts. But my sensei tells you he's got, a, he's got I think, an eighth degree black belt. But he will tell you, Brother Siraj, don't do this to him. I said, Assalamu alaikum, Sensei. Where this come from? This all, this bowing. We don't do that except to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this humility, you should have in your prayer. Brother and sister, when you go to your prayer, Allahu Akbar, don't you know that it's Allah himself who can cut off our breath at any second? I mentioned I just came from the Mina camp, Muslim youth, about an hour and a half a ride from here. And I reminded them that brothers and sisters, you can't even kill yourself if Allah don't want to. You say, Imam Suraj, but I read over 30,000 Americans kill themselves a year. That's true. But you probably don't know that 400,000 attempt to kill themselves every year. I'll prove it to you right now. Everybody. Hold your breath, and you keep on holding. You can't do it. So I'm going to stop breathing. <gasps> Try it. You can't. You hold it for a while, but sooner or later, you're going to have to breathe. Because, No soul can die except by the permission of Allah. It's already written in the book. So my brothers and sisters, if Allah has this power over us, why not be humble before him? Number two, every prayer should have ikhlas, sincerity of faith. And the biggest test, the biggest test of your ikhlas, your sincerity of faith, is when you are in outside the public view. Outside the public view. You know, the women and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is so wise. He is absolutely, well, he's the messenger of Allah, plain and simple. Women are not forced to go to the masjid. They're not, they don't have to ever go to the masjid. Nor can they be prevented from coming to the masjid. As from the guidance of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Don't prevent the female servants of Allah from going to the masjid. Even during his time, they went to the masjid, Salatul Fajr, Salatul Isha. One hadith you read, Mutafakun alayhi in Al-Bukhari and Muslim, 
one night midnight midnight it was midnight and Umar ibn Qatab knocked at the door of Prophet Muhammad wasalam, and said Ya Rasulullah we haven't made Isha yet and the women and the children are in the masjid they fell asleep waiting for you to lead Salat Isha the women and the children were in the masjid waiting at midnight for you to lead the Salat and the Prophet wasalam, told us that if it was not for the hardship of the people he would make Salat Isha all the time at midnight but the women were there read a hadith many of them the women were there yet he said yet their prayer is better for them at home look at the wisdom of that here's a woman a woman who has children and she said oh no time for salat I gotta get the kids together I gotta run to the masjid that weight is not put on her she don't have to go but the man almost have to go almost have to go to the masjid and do you know brothers and sisters during the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hardly any man didn't make his prayer in the masjid it is written by the Sahaba that some of them used to be carried uh, between the shoulders of men because they, had to, they wanted to go to the masjid to make prayer. And the Prophet said, brother, that if we knew the reward that we would get for Salatul Fajr and Isha in the masjid, we would go to the masjid even if we had to crawl. What does that mean? How can so many men stay away from the masjids? Because they don't know. They don't understand what is in it. They don't know. If they knew, they don't know. So they stay away from the masjid. They don't understand because if they did, they would go to the masjid even if they had to crawl. Imagine yourself in Detroit. Three miles away, four miles away, you had to crawl to the masjid. But yet we stay away. So every prayer should have, number one, every prayer should have this ikhlas. Why are you praying? My husband's not there. I'm not doing it for my husband. I'm not doing it for the imam. I'm not doing it for my children. I'm doing it for me because I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I worship Allah and nobody see me but Allah and yet I still do it. And then the man now. The man. The man. He gets up. Five o'clock in the morning. Where you going, brother? I gotta get to the masjid. Oh, make prayer right here in your house. No, I, I, want, a, I want more barakah. I want 27 times more barakah. So he goes and he, he, he makes wudu and he goes to the masjid. He walks, he takes a cab, he takes a bus, he, he takes a car, he gets there. And he prays. Other brothers are there. He meets the brothers, the brotherhood. And now he must make sure his niya is correct. I'm doing it for Allah. And the proof of it is when he can't make it to the masjid. Now's the test. Nobody's around. Will you make it then? You're in your room in the hotel, in the Omni. It's at night. You didn't make Isha yet. Nobody know where you are. Nobody's there. Just you in the room away from home what would you do then? Ikhlas do it for Allah pray for Allah and then dhikr dhikrullah the remembrance of Allah the prayer is for the remembrance of Allah remember Allah now brothers and sisters let me share this with you I'm almost finished I'm almost finished. A few years ago, I was in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. During Ramadan, and I experienced one of the greatest experiences of my life. I had found me a masjid. There was an imam who had a very wonderful recitation of Quran. His recitation was so good, I would leave my hotel early in the morning walking and I would walk past five or six masjids just to get to that one masjid because 
the Imam recited so well. And I would go every day, and brothers and sisters, I would enjoy myself listening to Quran because to me, there's nothing better in the earth than good recitation of Quran. When I was a young teenager, I used to like to listen to music. I had all the records. But when I heard the Quran, everything else to me sounded ugly. It's the Quran and the, the feeling that you get when someone recites the Quran in the right way that made me love, love this Quran. And so I was so happy here was Ramadan and, and I went to the masjid hearing the Imam recite. And one day a brother came to me from Riyadh and said, Imam Saraj, tonight I want to take you to a masjid. This Imam, he recites so good, he'll make you cry. I said, brother, I got my masjid. Let me go to my masjid. He said, no, brother Saraj, please let me take you. This Imam, he will make you cry. I said, okay. Now, brothers and sisters, we went to the biggest masjid in Riyadh. This masjid was so big, they had thousands of cars in the parking lot. A huge masjid. And so I said, okay. I walked in the masjid, and the first thing I noticed was hundreds of boxes of tissue on the floor. I said, uh-oh. This imam, he started... Allahu Akbar and he recited Wallahi the best recitation of Quran I ever heard in my life he sounded like an angel and brothers and sisters Wallahi he got to a point of recitation I didn't cry I booed <laughs> and everybody in the mess she was crying the men and the women and the children, everybody was crying the entire, the entire master. Why? Wasn't the imam giving the khutbah? No, no khutbah, no speech, no talk. Just the words of Allah recited in such a way that you feel the khushua and you felt the humbleness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you recite the Quran the right way, learn how to recite. It affects you. It touches you. And you don't just recite to get rid of it, to get over it. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Rahman, Malik, Yomi, Dunya, Kanabur. You're not doing that. You're learning how to recite the Quran. And if the Quran is so special and Salat is so special, why we run through the, the Salat? Why we just try to get rid of it and we got everything on our mind because we're not focusing on the thing that Allah wants us to focus on. He wants us to focus on Salat and He wants us to focus on Al-Quran and He wants us to focus on correct recitation of Quran. And that's why it's one of my greatest desires to really learn how to really recite the Quran so the people want to come to the prayer to hear the recitation of Quran and be reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not finished yet. Many brothers and sisters sitting in this room here, I must admit, have a tremendous advantage over me, born in America, never heard any Arabic until a few years ago. And now my religion is Islam, and I, I want to know, I, I want to know what I'm talking about. I want to know the words of Quran. I don't want to read Yusuf Ali's translation. I don't want to read Pictor's translation. I want to know what Allah is saying, and I want to know what Prophet Muhammad is saying. So I got to now learn Arabic. I can't speak it, but I got to learn it. I got to take time to learn it. I'm hardly getting English together. Now I got to learn Arabic. Because I learned the lesson. And I, from the Quran, opened up my eyes. Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu la taqrabu salah wa antum sukara hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun Oh you who believe do not approach salat while you are intoxicated until you understand what you are saying I'm not intoxicated but I don't understand what I'm saying 
And therefore, brothers and sisters, as long as we don't understand what we're saying, we're reciting the Quran, we're getting worship, we're doing worship, we're getting uh, ibad, we're getting a tawab from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but yet the words of the Quran is not penetrating us because we don't understand it. We're not focusing on what's being said. Therefore, I said, yes, I got to learn. I got to learn Arabic. So when I read the Quran, I understand what's being said. And wallahi, since I learned some Arabic, my prayer is 100% better. Because when you pray, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about His greatness as a creator, then you feel more humble, and you, you move more dhikr, and you don't want no thoughts of shaitan to come, because you're focusing on the beautiful words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brothers and sisters, every prayer must have the dhikr of Allah. Dhikr of Allah. Remember Allah. And also ikhlas and khushu'ah, humbleness. And when you pray, in my conclusion, you face the Qibla. One of the great keys is to stay focused. Don't look around. Don't look up. I couldn't believe once, actually, I was praying, and I was in line. And there was a young man standing in front of me. And I was down like this, and I can see him. And doing the prayers, going like this. <coughs> Stay focused. Keep your mind focused on the area where you're going to make your prostration. That's what the prophet did. And pray, pray. As if you're, it's your last prayer. If we do that, brothers and sisters, inshallah, we can focus. And now this, remember. Your worship is not the end product. No. Yes, it's to help you get somewhere else. Imagine this. You fasted the entire month of Ramadan. How easy Allah made it for you. You fasted the whole month. Water. Sometimes we had Ramadan in the, in the heat of summer. And yet you went long days without water, without food. Young brother just got married. He went the whole day without touching his wife. And now Ramadan is over. You should come out of that discipline, full of the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now carry it over into the next month of Shawwal. And be like that for the rest of the year. Just focus. Don't lose the discipline of Ramadan. And don't lose the discipline of your Salat. And don't lose the discipline of your zakat or any ibadah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I say this, brothers and sisters, in my conclusion. You ever notice Imam Yusuf gave a beautiful talk here last night. I don't know how many of you heard it. Very beautiful. I love and respect him. Imam Zaid, Shakir, and the rest of them. You ever notice how some people, they can learn so much of Quran and we can't seem to get it. Others can learn a hadith and they know the isnad and all of the details, the meanings. We have some among us who could, they fast, the fast of David every other day and how easy it is for them. Some can stay up all night and pick up the Quran and they can study hours after hours yet some pick it up in five minutes they sleep. You ever notice why, why some people seem it's easier for some and others is so difficult they can't do it? I leave you with these words of Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. He said, مَنْ سَلَقَ تَارِيكًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَحَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ تَارِيكًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Whoever takes a road Seeking knowledge, Allah will make easy for him a road to paradise. Some is easy. Brother, how did you learn the verse? How? I just did it. I just sat down and I did it. You know why? Because he's not wasting 40 hours a week on TV. He's 
not wasting hours with the music on his ears and all the foolishness and all of that. He's not wasting time. He made dua to Allah. Allahumma inni a'udhubika min ilman la yanfa'u. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from knowledge that doesn't benefit. What does it benefit me if I know how much Michael Jordan scored for the last 10 years? What does it benefit me if I know who's on uh, uh, Guiding Light? I don't know the name of those programs. What benefit is it? And so, brothers and sisters, when you seek knowledge, go after knowledge. Allah will make easy for you the road to Jannah. And you know what? You will do your worship, and guess what? You love it. You get to a point like this. One day I was in the masjid one evening. Uh, one afternoon, and a brother came running in, big brother, I'll never forget the expression on his face. He said, Imam, did I miss the prayer? Did I miss the prayer? And I said, no, brother. And he wasn't talking about the prayer, he was talking about congregation prayer. He was so concerned, I saw the look of concern on his face because he wanted to pray with the Jamaah. We should be like that. We should be like, what, what time? My, my prayer. Oh, my salat. Guard your prayer. Guard your prayer. Let nobody, nothing standing away from your prayer. Someone come next to you and say, you want to do something? No, I got I to gotta make my prayer in 10 minutes. Put Allah first. And if you study, seek knowledge for the pleasure of Allah, not only will you do the worship, Allah will make easy for you the road to Jannah. And you know what? You can't wait to pray. You can't wait. Oh my, five minutes for Fajr. Oh, I can't wait. Yes. May Allah guide us, help us, to make us love Him, make us do the ibadah, make us love the ibadah, and have mercy on us. I mean, salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah May Allah bless you. Thank you very much. Takbir for Brother Siraj. Takbir. Here. Brothers, uh, one of the verses that Sayyid Qutb uh, stood and uh, was just looking at it and uh, he was trying to see how it fits in place in Surah An-Nisa, chapter of women in the Quran. And that verse was about Salah. وَإِذَا كُنْتَ فِيهِمْ فَأَقَمْتَ لَهُمُ الصَّلَاةِ And if you are among them, and you establish the prayer for them, then you do this and this and this. And Sayyid Qutb was kind of puzzled. And the way he expressed it was that he couldn't see why, is, why it's put in there. Because all the verses were talking about jihad and fighting for the sake of Allah. And suddenly comes the verse about Salah. And he says, this to show us the importance that even if we are under the most difficult circumstances, we cannot leave Salah. Please look at it. I had a, we had a, one of the Isna's convention in Kansas City. One of the people, we hired some Americans, non-Muslims, to come and do the videotaping for us. And at the end of the, one of the days of the convention, one of them came to me and he said, I'd like to get a tape, one of the tapes that you had today. I'll be happy to pay for it. He said, don't worry, you just get a copy of it, no problem. What tape would you like to get? Believe me, I expected that he's going to say the tape of Dr. Jamal Badawi or most of the knowledgeable speakers that we have. But for my surprise, the tape that he asked for was the music that you play today. <laughs> and by the music we play today, he meant the recitation that the Imam was reading in the prayers. I said, it's not the music. He said, I don't know, it just came deep into my heart for some reasons. And he never knew in his life, well, what is this or what do we mean by it? just the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us 
وَلَقَدْ يَسَّمْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ نُدَّكَ We have made it easy for people to read the Qur'an. Is there anybody who's going to start? Made it easy for us. Imagine somebody who doesn't understand Arabic at all and memorizes all of it. Isn't that amazing? We know English. If I give you a book in French, can you read it? How about if I ask you to memorize all of it? It does happen. Last week, in, uh, two weeks ago in Houston, Didat was given, Ahmed Didat, was given a speech. And there was a, one of the reciters of the Quran, like Abdul Basit Abdul Samad. I was amazed at the level he was reciting. I asked him at the end, where are you from? He said he's from Africa someplace, I forgot. How did you learn Quran? So they just listened to tapes. Immediately I, when he was reading, I thought that he, he's a, I know the right reading. I, I took courses in it, I know it very well. So I felt comfortable, I'm now behind an expert. I thought he knows all the secrets of it. And he recites it exactly like Sheikh Abdul Basit Abdul Samad. Wallahi, I was amazed when he told me that he just learned it himself. And this tells us the importance of looking at the verse, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْمُ الْمُدَّكِرِ We have made it easy for the Muslims to recite the Qur'an. Let the Muslims recite it. May Allah bless us all with the blessings of ibadah, with the benefits of ibadah, and make us all, inshaAllah, among the sincere Muslims who try to establish their deen. Ameen. We'll start taking questions, and we have, inshallah, about 15 minutes. So we'll start uh, with Imam Dawood. You please take the first question. We'll have the prayers after that, inshallah. We'll make jump. Please, we'll make the prayers after 15 minutes. For those who are from Detroit, and they, I don't know what, ta what time is Detroit time for the Maghrib? Anybody from Detroit? Five ten. So we're still okay, alhamdulillah. Okay, five ten. yeah. Okay. Go ahead, brother. Please, silence, please. This question... I'll take care of it. This question says, please explain when you say we should love our government, how can we love an oppressed government like the Egyptian government? During the time of our Prophet, the prayers and the peace be on him, it was by the invitation of some Jews in Medina that the Prophet went to Medina. When the Al-Islam was established in the peninsula of Arabia in Mecca. Silence, please. It was Prophet Muhammad that led the example and told the Muslims not to fight these people, that our Islam has been established. And the Prophet also gave instructions that anyone that can read and write, anyone in Mecca that can read and write that was not a Muslim, that they would gain their freedom or they would gain livelihood if they taught the Muslims that could not read and write. In America, when I say love the government, now see that's why I told you earlier when I spoke about the English language is real tricky. But I also told you what Allah says in the Quran that we should enjoin that which is right, forbid that which is evil, and um, we should be in a race for all that is good. So therefore, I see in this room men and women boys and girls 
that are going to become government officials, are going to become professors in universities, are going to become very prominent individuals in the influence of the American society. And if we do not believe that and look at this society as being contaminating, then we're going to miss the favor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. When Moses saw wrong in Egypt, Moses fought the wrong. But Moses fought... Uh, we can't continue on that, please. So if somebody having something urgent that you want to talk about, please take that person you want to talk to and talk outside and come back, please. So yes, so that's what I meant when I said you can love the government. Moses fought Pharaoh. Moses didn't say, I give in to Pharaoh. Moses recognized the Lord of all the worlds, became obedient to Allah, and that was the criteria for his success. And we have to realize that. So therefore, you can't walk around believing that love means that there has to be some embracement. Love means, according to our prophet, what did the prophet say? If you love your brother, you hold him back from the wrong. So when I say we love this government, I say you should love it, you should hold this government from the wrong, make this government accountable, and make sure as dignified Muslims that we don't forget what was said today, establish our religion, be proud of it, don't let nobody make us be ashamed of it, and look toward the future, we have some say-so, and these children that were born in America, you will speak English very well. And hopefully you'll never forget the Arabic language and the words of Allah in the Quran. And more and more of us will learn from each other. And you'll be surprised when you see the curriculum of these United States in the schools that are outside the private, the private schools that we're going to have with the Arabic language being a selective choice. Assalamu alaikum. I'll try to do this very quickly and then we can I'll break for salah because you don't want to be you don't want to be late for salah. Um, so many questions, very similar, so I'll say both of them. Alhamdulillah. Um, what is the name of the Imam in Saudi Arabia that made Brother Siraj cry? Brother Siraj, please tell us the name or address of the masjid where you cried so that we can visit the masjid if we ever get over there, inshallah. That's a good point. The she Imam's name is Sheikh Saleh. I'll never forget Sheikh Saleh. Because, uh, by the way, that became my new masjid. It was a long distance from where I was, but I went over there to pray behind him. And it's in Riyadh. Just look for, I think... Um, is, was built by the daughter of the king. So I don't know, just look for the biggest masjid in Riyadh, inshallah, you will find it, Sheikh Saleh. Huh? This is all I remember, Sheikh Saleh. I'm sorry. Um, I, I go to uh, uh, all day, I go to school all day until 3.15. Then I have to be at work by 3.30 until 8.30. What should I do about prayers I missed? And when I pray and read the surah, I don't understand what I'm saying. And I want to put this one with um, uh, this one. Uh, please encourage uh, the young people that even if they don't understand all of the, all of the Salat now, they should still um, read all the, sur all the Salats and inshallah Allah will guide them. Good. Good point. I didn't mean to say don't make prayer if you don't understand it. Make prayer, it's ibadah, even if you don't understand any Arabic for the rest of your life, Allah will still reward you for reciting Al-Quran. But it'd be better if you understand it, and even better if you implement what you understand. Now, also, um, sister or brother, please be aware of making your salah. Get out of the habit of saying, I'll make up my prayer later. Find a way. You find a way in school. What we did years ago, before we had Muslim schools in New York City, we started a project called Project, uh, project, uh, um, um, project Prelude. And we talked to the principal, and we let them know we brought 70 Muslims in that school. We got a room for them for, quote-unquote, Arabic and Islamic studies. They made their salats there. You can break it, brothers. All you got to do is stand up in school, let them know that you're Muslim and that you have to find a place. You find this place to make your salat. Stop, stop going home and talking about you're going to make up three prayers. We have salats in the prescribed time. You know how important salat is? I remember one of the battles, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, it was Salatul Maghrib. And he said, you know what? Because we were fighting, we missed Salatul Asr. The Prophet said, the same thing happened to me. May Allah curse and fill the bellies of the disbelievers with fire because they made us miss our Salat. How much more should we make our Salat on time? Stop 
letting people stop you from making your salat. And on your job, you find a place. Find a place. If you have to leave the job for five minutes, you know, people give you break, you have coffee breaks, you can go to the restroom. You find a way, brothers and sisters, stop uh, missing your salat because it's something very, very important. Uh, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold us accountable on Yom Qiyamah. And one more. Okay. Um, should I fast during pregnancy? Because the doctors say it is not good to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Quran an excuse. Women, uh, women cannot. Fin women cannot Marda ala safra ala safra. Now, women can and marid and ala safra for edetan min ayam and ukra. Whoever is fasting or on a journey should make, or sick or on a journey, should fast days later. If the pregnancy is in such that if you fast, it makes you sick or you're sick or it's in danger to you or the baby, you don't have to fast, you can make it up later. But you can, if you're pregnant and it's no difficulty for you, your doctor says it's no problem, then you can do it and it's no problem and you can in fact fast. Many sisters do. And also a brother made a recommendation, uh, um, not only the book, um, uh, Sheikh Albani's book, um, The Salat of the Prophet, but he mentioned the book of the Reliance of the, of the Traveler, which is a good book which goes in detail about Salat. And the last one, I hear from a lot of parents how they have to remind their teenage children uh, um, every time it's time for prayer. What's wrong? Keep on reminding them, but go to the basics because I think that their problem is not prayer. Their problem is Iman. And you got to deal with Iman. You got to go to the root of the problem and Tawheed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. as alaykum wa rahmatullah. I'll let you. Just, yeah, I'll let you. Just one comment. Uh, there, there is a very important note that I would like you to know concerning the Salah in addition to what uh, Imam Siraj said, which is made by Imam Ibn Taymiyyah. If you don't pray, you are punished for that, right? We all know that. If you don't pray, you're punished. If you pray, that's what Ibn Taymiyyah is saying, and you don't, don't concentrate on your prayers, you don't, you don't know what you're doing, you get the edge of saving yourself the punishment. You see? If you pray and you know what you're doing, you get the full edge. Please come in, brother. We're going to have to go, so these questions may not be satisfying, but it says here. Okay, ask your question, brother. No, 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 no. Oh, okay, all right, okay. Ooh, look at this right here, alhamdulillah. Okay, what do you, okay. Yes, anytime someone is sick, the Quran has always been a source of healing for us. And the question was, what do you think about recitation of specific ayats for different reasons like in sickness and in trouble? And we should always seek Allah's help and guidance. And we should always pray for our sick. And we should always encourage that. And what better way to pray than the words of Allah in the Quran? Surely Allah has the power of all things. This, this student right here is an 18-year-old freshman in college. And he says that the peer pressure or sexual pressure is on him. And what should he do? He said fasting helps, but it's still a big problem. Should he drop out of college? Our prophet, the prayer, that's not funny. Our prophet, the prayers and the peace be on him, said the matters are judged by intention. And if we have an obligation to do something. God Most High says in the Quran that surely when a difficulty comes to a, a believer, that same one comes to a disbeliever, but a believer has Allah and a disbeliever has no one. And we have to understand that in life there's a struggle. And he wants to know, should he get married, drop out of school and get married? Well, my question again is, is this, are you ready for marriage? You shouldn't get married to fulfill a sexual need. In our Islam, we should be getting married because we want to assume the responsibility. Because how can that marriage last if you're just trying to fulfill something that's sexual? There's more to our women than that. So therefore, you're going to have to work through that part and discuss that and, and, and look at your own self and, and find out what is causing you to, to, to be um, so eager to prove what's going on. But remember that um, we do not do things for pleasure. We do them to please Allah. We do them to be obedient to Allah. And that's part of the marriage, but that's not something that should be your primary goal. This other part of the question says, does an individual have to finance his own Hajj? As an adult, it's your responsibility. If you're given a trip to go to Hajj, then you can accept it. 
But as an adult, that's your responsibility. As for a young person, if I want to take my child to Hajj at 15 or 14 years old and I can afford it, I can go. But one should not go to Hajj if it's going to cause financial trouble back here where you can't pay for your bills because you sacrificed all your money not wisely. So what we should do is we should prepare for Hajj and look at it and say, I'm going to save this much money this year, I'm going to save this much money next year, and eventually all this money is set up for Hajj, and I'm going because I've saved all this money, and it's not going to affect my livelihood. And the last, the last question. Let's take one from Oh, okay. Well, this, this sister right here. Let me just, okay. Well, let me just say this. The sister that asked the question um, about being lonely, and she's a practicing Muslim, well, I'm going to say to you, continue to go around Muslims and then search your own soul as to what's lonely. What's your definition of lonely? I can't answer it till you tell me what lonely means to you. Uh, we have to stop for the Salah, so we'll take a comment from here or a question and from this side, from the sisters and from the brothers over here, and we'll stop for the prayers, inshallah. So, please, go ahead, since you wanted them to start. Go ahead, listen. Can, can you let the, the old... Go ahead. If we're all um, like um, Christians and um, Muslims and, and Jews and all those different kind of people, blacks and, and Chinese, then how can we all relate to the same grand grand-grandfather. What did he do? Can you explain? No, Sam, I asked your other person. Can I answer You know, basically she says, um, you know, Adam and Eve, and, and we're all Christians, Muslims, and Jews, and blacks, and Chinese. <laughs> um, how could we all relate to the same grandparents? And that's an excellent question. You see, sister, and that's the problem with the world. The prophet made it very uh, plain that um, all of us are from Adam and Eve, and Adam is from dust. Think about it. Adam was made from dust, from the dust of the earth. And all of us are descendants from Adam. And as we went around the world, young sister, as we went around the world, all over the world, people developed into different races and different tribes. But always remember this phrase from the Quran. A'udhu billahi mina shaytani rajim, ya nas. Oh mankind, we created you from a male and female, Adam and Eve, and made you into nations and tribes that you may know one another. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of Allah are those who are most righteous. And that's the most important thing, not your skin color. And I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you this. We've got to get rid of this racism. We, as Muslims, have to get rid of it first. And remember what the Prophet Muhammad said, In Allah Ta'ala, la yandru ila asamikum wa la ila suwarikum wa lakin yandru ila kulubikum. Allah is not going to look at your bodies nor your forms. He's going to look at your hearts. And on the day of judgment, you're not going to get any credit because you're black or you're an Arab or your male or your female would be based upon your taqwa and your deeds. Go ahead. I want to ask, um, well, yesterday I was just talking to one of the sisters and, uh, and I just, I met her here and, uh, Mom got really mad because I was talking to her and everything, and I don't, understand, I, I don't understand why we're not supposed to talk to like sisters and like just be friends and stuff like that. It's very serious. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I want to apologize for her mother. I didn't mean anything, and. Um, Okay. I apologize for her mother. I, I, uh. Okay, okay. Um, well, let's look at it this way. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. If you want to talk to a sister in the future, then you should go find the parents or something 
that might kind of reduce the friction. If the, I don't know how old the girl is. I don't even know if she's old enough and the parents may not even want to talk to anyone. And then we have to remember another thing with a lot of parents, especially with us as Muslims, we have to be kind of conscious sometimes uh, of who our children are talking to. And that's just, that, that's natural. So, so learn a lesson from this and don't take things for granted and be assuming. But if you see someone that's, that you like to meet and everything, try to show the respect and Allah will bless you in time and you will be blessed with the best wife, the best friends because you have respect for their parents and their loved ones and we didn't assume what western ideas just say that I can go up and just talk to anybody and um, you lose the respect and the value because she might be 14, she might be 13, she just may be a big girl and um, the parents may not want that so we have to do some thinking. Alaikum min fusikum, our own self obligates us. So therefore, we have to become responsible. And that was nice of you to apologize to the parents. And um, don't take that as a damper on the religion. Don't be upset by it. But I hope in our Islam, we begin to bring the religion to its true point. Allah is most merciful. He's the only one to decide and the best of judges. And remember that right there. We're going to have to come to respect each other. But most of all, don't take things for granted when you're talking to children that have parents. Respect them. Uh, I would like to apologize for the sisters over here and the brother over here because that we have to pray Maghrib so that's why so yeah after that we have the next session will be the husband and wife settling husband wife dispute and we'll have more chance inshallah to discuss more issues uh, what we will do now we'll make the prayers at 5.30, we'll, we'll make the iqama for the prayers. For now, subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Imam Siraj has some tapes. Uh, Imam Siraj has some tapes in the back. If you buy two, you get one free. And for the tapes of the convention, we have them in the front over here. This conference. And also, this piece of paper here that I have contains an order form.
had a question of a person I heard you mention uh, talking to the Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank